This year's Nobel Prize is quite exciting, but not unexpected. Uh, watch, yeah, watch the broadcast. I usually like tuning in um, uh, and just trying to guess, uh, guess what it's going to be as they sort of start teasing the clues at the beginning of the announcements. To award the 2025 Nobel Prize in Chemistry to Susume Kitagawa, Kyoto University, Japan, Richard Robson, University of Melbourne, Australia, and Omar Jaggi, University of California at Berkeley, USA. Before the ceremony was completely finished, I realized that two of my younger colleagues, Ben Pilgrim and Matt Cliff, worked in this area. So I rushed off to find them to see if they had some nice samples of moths and perhaps some models to explain the chemistry in more detail. No, sometimes I watch it live, but this time I, was, I had to have a meeting with one of the technician, technical staff. And, uh, and then I was talking with her in the corridor, and Martin came around the corner uh, basically looking for me because the Nobel Prize, uh, of course, this year is in MOFs, which is what I, what I work on. It is for the creation of a new class of compounds, so called MOFs, metal organic frameworks. Their uh, repeating structure held up of sort of two components. The metals are almost like the glue that kind of hold the components together. And then the organic components, they're sort of these kind of rigid, rigid linkers that bridge between different metal ions. And what's different about these to other sorts of structures is how open they are. The Nobel Prize presenters or the committee members talked about it like Hermione's handbag in Harry Potter. Small on the outside, but very, very large on the inside. I've never read Harry Potter, so I don't know whether that's a good analogy. Do you know the TARDIS in Doctor Who? Yes. It's like that too. Yes. Yeah. You can think of it a bit like a kind, kind of like climbing frame where the sort of joints, uh, sort of the rods of the climbing frame are organic molecules and like the joints connecting them with the metal atoms. So it's um, a kind of self-assembled, uh, typically crystalline and not always material. So this model is kind of showing the general structure of a MOF. So uh, made out of metal here, these metal balls are actually where we would have our metal ions or clusters in the MOF. And then these colored rods there or organic components, they're the linkers that link them together. So those rods between the metals, that's not representing bonds. They are actually... That's a, whole, that's a whole molecule, a whole series of atoms linking these two together. In terms of the metals, they've been used, you know, across the whole variety of the, the periodic table. There's moths made from all of them, but um, ones like, uh, for example, zinc, iron, some of the ones you'd have commonly heard of are used a lot just because, again, they're, they're cheap and easy to access. Um, in terms of the linkers, again, uh, there's, there's a whole variety, you know, any kind of shape and size you want. In terms of the, 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 what we call the functional group, so what's at the end of the linker attached to the metal, uh, quite often that's something called a carboxylate. So that's a group with a carbon and two oxygens. It's got a negative charge, has some quite strong ionic uh, connections to the metal uh, that help kind of keep the structure together. But as I say, the, the real thing that separates these materials out from other types of materials is their porosity, their open space. So it can be, you know, up to perhaps 90% of the volume within a moth is actually empty space. That's, that's huge compared to um, a lot of typical materials where only a small percentage is empty space. And then shown in this model, these little water molecules, not really to scale, but this is just to kind of show you the concept that small molecules, maybe it's water, maybe it's carbon dioxide, can pass freely through the pores of this structure, maybe adsorb into the interior. So this was a material that was going to help sequester water from the atmosphere. Richard Robson, who is in Australia, who was the first person who had the idea of making these materials. He was inspired by the structure of diamond, which has a regular arrangement of carbon atoms, and wondered whether he could make an organic and metal compound with metal ions and organic groups, which had the same structure, but much bigger spaces between them. 
when we heard the Nobel Prize, we went, and went to the lab to try and grab some to see what we had in the stock, basically. This is nickel uh, dichloride uh, 213 benzothiodiazole, uh, nickel BTD. This is an iron 2 one, an iron compound that's related. And we have uh, a less colorful manganese material here. This is manganese triazolate. Uh, so we've got, you know, these are relatively large amounts of materials that we'd make and we made these ones for magnetic studies, for neutron diffraction studies. Robson's work was done a long time ago, in the 1980s. And after that, Sasumo Kitagawa in Japan made conceptually similar structures, but Robson had ions, nitrates or whatever, in the gaps in the structure Kitagawa had water molecules which, when you heated up the material, could come out. So you were left with a much freer structure where other molecules could go in. But we've got uh, some classic materials, so this one is UO66 amino. What's in that one? Has that got uranium? No, oh, yeah, okay, you've, we've, we've stumbled across one of the fun things, or not terribly fun things, about moth. Uh, chemistry, which is that because they're relatively complex in terms of the composition, they've all got sort of uh, official nicknames. So UIO is the uh, Norwegian for University of Oslo, and it's a 66 material. ZIF8 is uh, just zeolitic imidazolate framework, so it's another chemical name. It's uh, zirconium. That's zirconium. Yeah, yeah, zirconium. And that U stands for university. Yes. The third recipient, you remember only three people can win the prize was Oma Yagi, who's originally from Jordan and now works at the University of California in Berkeley, who has made a vast range of different moths. It is his group that made the compounds that can take water from the air and make supply drinking water, which by chance we described a week ago in our video about dysprosium. And there are groups in California who are trying to make emergency water supplies for travelers, for soldiers in the field, using compounds that will attract water from the air. We were right on the ball for this year's Nobel Prize. It's great news. Uh, I mean, already MOFs is, uh, is a huge field. Uh, I think what would be good is for MOFs to um, make real headway in terms of commercial applications on a large scale. So whether that's in bulk materials for CO2 capture, water harvesting, maybe water purification. I have been involved a small amount in making MOFs, not making original compounds, but scaling them up in flow systems and my colleague Ed Lester in chemical engineering has created a company and they're now a major manufacturer of MOFs and if we're lucky they'll show you a sample. This is almost a world exclusive this is our brand new rig that we call Matisse so MOF adsorption test rig in forming scaled up engineering and basically it's a system that allows us to take the MOFs, allows us to flow gases through that, like a simulated flue gas from an energy plant, and the MOF will strip out the CO2 and then leave behind that a kind of cleaned up flue glass um, that we'll be able to use for all kinds of different things. So the MOFs would be in each one of these columns. So you would see here, this is where the MOF would be. We'd flow the gas all the way through the bottom. The MOF would trap the carbon dioxide. The cleaned up flue glass would come out the top. And then we, in this particular model, we would vent it. But then once that moth gets saturated, it's a, basically a cycling process. We'd move over to the next column. Once that one gets saturated, we would have regenerated this one and removed the pure CO2. And then basically we switch between columns left, right and center. And in this particular case, is the moth's almost like a, like a sponge filter that you're stuffing in the chimney? Yeah, exactly. I think that's the best way to think about them as um, little sponges or sieves. You know, the, the work that the inventors of MOFs did, like Omar Yagi and people like that, you know, what they did was basically create these structures with metal ions at the corner and then organic linkers. 
these create uh, almost tuned pores or holes that are just the right size for a gas molecule, like a carbon dioxide, such that it would trap that molecule and let the other ones pass through. And you can see almost immediately, as soon as we started flowing it through the, uh, through the moth, you see that CO2 concentration drop down to almost zero. These are the ones that are actually in this system right now. So these are what the particles look like. I mean, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to optimize the shape and the form of these, whether it needs to be a fine powder or whatever that size particle needs to be. That's what the system designers and the chemical engineers over time will all figure out to make that more of an optimized system. It's one of those areas that's kind of very big in sort of chemistry, like, you know, most chemistry departments will have a, a group or two working on metal organic frameworks nowadays, but it hasn't, I think, fully crossed over to the public consciousness because they are, you know, really only, you know, depending on how you define it, only really about 30 years old. Um, and they haven't got the same kind of the big application that you'd, you wouldn't find a moth in like your, uh, in your house probably. The key point about the discovery by these all three scientists is not so much the materials they made, but they opened up the principle so almost anybody could make a moth. Yeah, so here's just a, a couple of different examples of the, the moths that we produce. So, so here you can see one which is very similar to what's in the carbon capture rig that we showed you previously. So you can see the pellets here, slightly different form to what we had um, in the last demonstration. So that's one particular moth where you can see probably around 25 kilos here. So it's, it's interesting that people in the moth world are still mainly talking about grams, maybe kilograms, right? We're already at the ton scale. So we just recently completed an order whereby, you know, we just sent four tons of material to a customer for a gas storage application, as an example. We've got a completely different moth, completely different, different metals, different linker molecules, um, but it allows us to use different moths for the different exciting applications that we're working on. Carbon capture, uh, water harvesting, gas storage, biogas upgrading, you know, pretty important energy sensitive applications where we're going to make a big difference in, in decarbonization and what the world has been challenged with. We've got good capability to make hundreds of tons to, to satisfy customer demand over the next couple of years, but we're using some of the investment money that we recently took on to expand our capability and move into future facilities that allow us to continue to grow with that demand. Of the three Nobel Prize winners, I've only met one of them Omar Yagi, we were at a conference together, quite a small conference with several Nobel Prize winners and several more people who might win Nobel Prizes. And in the group photo, you can see I'm just standing behind Omar Yagi, probably the closest I'll ever get to a Nobel Prize winner. Tells you what the what this one is. You haven't even looked at this one, but you know exactly the property of this. And you can do the same. You can look at a different property on this, and it will tell you what the property of this is. Experiment. We're just using the unnatural amino acid um, homopropargylglycine. Have to write that down for me. Yes, it's, it's usually just abbreviated to HPG.